so it's a, a ple uh, an absolute pleasure to uh, welcome Hillary Mason here today. Uh, she is the uh, uh, chief scientist at Bitly, and if you haven't seen little Bitly links floating around, they've, they've obviously been in front of you somewhere, um, because there are an enormous number of them. So it's just simply uh, compressing links, which is uh, in, into very short strings, uh, which has been a, you know, a tremendously useful thing in the age of Twitter, where you have uh, great restrictions on, uh, on the number of characters you can put out. So, used everywhere, and uh, as Hillary's pointed out to me, not everything that says, uh, so there are many, many other little shortenings which are really owned by Bitly, so it's kind of all over the place and you don't realize it. And, you know, beyond that, so that, all right, so that's a cool thing. It's something that we use everywhere. Uh, the company um, uh, itself uh, stores an enormous amount of data. So there's an amazing amount of stuff that's going on behind the scenes that Hillary's going to talk about today, analyzing how people behave, how links are shared, all sorts of stuff about influence and contagion and so on um, that, that's going on behind. So it, is in, it, it appears to be this very simple, um, and it is a very simple, uh, uh, um, structure for a company, but then there's all these problems with big data are there, um, amazingly interesting uh, stuff uh, that they're able to, uh, you know, move through. Um, what else am I going to say? So, uh, Hillary's a uh, sort of a big data champion. She's, you know, one of the sort of more famous people in the world, I think, now uh, in, in this sort of data scientist arena. Uh, she was just in Glamour magazine. So she's you know, become kind of an evangelist for you know talking about uh, about uh, about data and, and being a programmer and she has a, a lovely line in there which is uh, teaching someone to program roughly uh, is like giving them a superpower and and you know it's beautifully said and and that's a that's a great thing to read in Glamour magazine aside from everything else so that was all very well done um, she owns uh, I think this is quite nice she owns iHeartData.com or maybe you've forgotten about it but I Hard data, because you can register all sorts of funny little symbols that uh, no one can actually see in their uh, browser address. Um, and so today we're going to hear uh, a lot about what goes on. Well, we'll hear what you tell us, but I think it's going to be about uh, you know, this, this, this trying to find meaning in masses and masses of data, um, trying to find structure in, in all of this stuff that we're producing collectively, all this social media, um, through uh, what seems to be just a very simple thing. Okay. Uh, oh, thank you. Can everyone hear me? I have a mic, but I don't know how. Uh, yeah. Better? Yeah. All right. Um, hi, so I'm Hillary. Um, I feel obligated to say that the, the Glamour magazine piece was designed to get young women who read Glamour but don't think about computer science or about math to think about computer science and math. and. I hope it's accomplished that. I got some really bizarre emails on my website <laughs> after that came out. So, um, so hopefully it's, uh, it's in the right direction. Um, so I'm Hillary. I'm the chief scientist at Bitly. Uh, and I have a few different themes for this talk. Um, and we can sort of weight them higher or lower as you like. I'm very happy to keep this fairly informal. Um, I'm going to speak for a while and show you some examples of the kinds of problems we think about, how we think about them, uh, some results. And then I'm going to show you some data uh, demos, so systems that are working in real time that do hopefully cool things. Uh, and then there will be plenty of time for questions and all that stuff. Um, but the themes are the science. So there is science here. Uh, it crosses a variety of different fields. Uh, the engineering, and that is the infrastructure requirements and how you actually build the systems to enable us to do the science we want to do. Uh, the philosophy, that is, uh, how we ask the right questions, how we know what to work on and what to look at. Um, and the last one is really for the people in the audience who might be curious about what a reformed academic career is like in the startup community uh, and what kinds of things we actually do and spend our time doing and what opportunities might be around for you. Uh, and so I know people can be pretty shy about asking those questions, but please don't hesitate. Uh, and before I get into the fun stuff, uh, these are my colleagues. So I'm going to be saying we do this in the academic sense of we, meaning the royal we, meaning they, essentially. Um, and I also wanted to bring this up because I think it's important to realize that uh, my background is computer science. And Brian, who's standing next to me in this photo, is also a computer scientist. 
But also in this photo are uh, two physicists, an applied mathematician, and a guy who's been building search engines for a very long time. Uh, and I thought it was important to mention that we work, uh, we come at things from a variety of different perspectives, and it's important to have that in one team when you're working on these kinds of systems. And this is now often called data science, um, and I do have to confess to being part of the conspiracy to make data science a real thing. Um, it really, it has been a conspiracy, and that's a whole other story I can tell you about later. Um, but data scientists are not doing anything that people have not already done for many, many years. The only difference is that they're doing it all in one person at the same time. And so I think of data science as this blend of a few different skills, um, math, engineering, computer science, and hacking, and asking the right questions. And at the intersection of these, of course, <laughs> but it gets better, right? Because um, these people are kind of hard to find. People who can really deeply understand mathematics and have that domain knowledge, uh, people who can actually work with production data systems, um, and then people who have enough empathy for humankind to think about the right questions to ask are very hard to find. And that's what I mean when I say data science, and that's what we do at Bitly. So I think everyone here has heard of Bitly, but how many people here until today thought of Bitly as the Twitter URL shortener? All right, thank you. Um, that's our biggest public perception problem. Um, Bitly does indeed take big things and make them small. This is where our logo comes from, it's the blowfish. Um, and that means we take URLs that look like this and return URLs that look like that. Um, until a couple weeks ago, actually, these URLs were generated with a Jenkins hash function, which um, one of our engineers copied off of Wikipedia in the C code. Um, and that caused all kinds of issues. Uh, now we have a much better way of generating those things. Uh, but these short URLs go on to show up in all kinds of places. So they do show up in places like this. Uh, they show up in places like this. The Dalai Lama loves Bitly. Um, they show up inside of Minecraft and on networks like YouTube. Um, and they're all around the world. So this is an image I made a year ago, actually, of there's no lines on this map, and in fact, it's kind of hard to see, but um, this is just the latitude and longitude of bitly clicks in an hour of traffic. Uh, and if you take any bitly powered link, uh, whether it's bit.ly or any other domain, and you add a plus sign at the end, you'll get something that looks like this. This is our public info page. Um, and all of the data you see on this page is also available through the API. So we've always had this philosophy of gathering the data uh, and giving it back to people, um, either the people who create the link or just people who are interested in it. Uh, and this is, I'll come back to this later, but this is an example of a very popular, very organically human shared link. You can read the title for yourself. Now, since Bitly sits in the middle of all of these different social networks, we're able to see when a link jumps from one platform to another. Um, and so it's not just Twitter. In fact, Twitter is about 10% of the data we see. Facebook is a similar percentage. Um, and then it goes to uh, a whole long tail of other networks. So Tumblr is much bigger than most people realize. We see a lot of email copy and paste sharing. Uh, and then things that those of us who are hip in the internet no longer even consider to be social networks like MySpace and LiveJournal actually still send us a fair amount of data, WordPress and all that fun stuff. Um, and then those things that are not social network platforms per se at all, like Cabo Hotel, the virtual world, largely populated by Brazilian teenagers, um, Second Life, and uh, Minecraft. So all of this was a total surprise, and this, by the way, Oh, it's so dim. This was one of the most clicked on baby photos of 2011. Um, so Bitly was never intended uh, to be a huge uh, company. It was an accident. Uh, and in fact, starting Bitly was an accident. And the fact that it became a company was essentially an accident and very good luck. And so we found ourselves suddenly in the position of having lots of data and sort of with the opportunity to make something really interesting out of it. And so at this point, we have um, oh, these are all orders of magnitude, but uh, approximately 80 million unique URLs enter the system every day, uh, over 300 million clicks on those URLs, 
Uh, about 110 million of those we believe to be human beings. Uh, and so in t that's actually a hard problem. <laughs> Um, so in total, we've got tens of billions of URLs. I don't actually know the precise number because I wanted to find out what it had gotten up to and I asked our engineer who's working on that piece of the database and he said, uh, at scale, MySQL does not let you count. Um, so, so we know approximately, um, but it's, it's still a big number. Uh, and we have an average of uh, 3.6 URLs a day from people who are active users of social networks. So that means uh, if you click on links from Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, and that whole set of properties, uh, we'll see 3.6 URLs that you click on per day. Uh, people share far fewer, but, um, but that's the amount of data. Uh, so to give you a sense of what that data actually looks like, we have three kinds of data. The first is that share event. So we see uh, the user, the link itself, the network it's shared onto you. Depending on um, how it's done, we see the text that goes with it. Um, we see the IP, the user agent, uh, a cookie, and the timestamp, and the time zone, and the language in the browser. Essentially anything you can pull out of the browser headers. And with the click event, we see the same thing. Um, so we know who created the link, who clicked on the link if they're logged in, uh, where in the world they're located, what their time zone is, their device, uh, all that fun stuff. And then we pull the content itself. So we will fetch everything shared through Bitly, and if it's under five megs, we'll actually try and look at it and understand it. Uh, so for a page like this, we have a content extraction system that can identify that this is the meaningful content in the page. Um, and then we pull out a bunch of different things. So we look at, there they are, the language. We look at the locations that are relevant to this. And I'll come back to those later because they're really cool. Uh, the topics, and topics are just a pretty classic supervised learning uh, thing that we built based on the words and the content uh, and the domain. Uh, key phrases in the article, the refers, uh, and a few other things. But essentially what we're gathering is this huge set of human gossip. Um, so it is pieces of content that one person has deliberately decided to share publicly or with another set of people, and then the response from those people, whether they paid attention or not, and whether they reshared it, and whether they reshared it out to the same network or a different network. Uh, and so I think there are a lot of things that we can learn about humanity from looking at a lot of gossip. Uh, the very first thing we realized is that my impression of a social network is not the same as yours. And so this is a tweet from a young woman uh, where she says any white person on Twitter is a spam account. Uh, for her, this is totally true. Um, if you pulled her, you know, we went in and looked at her, her social graph. Judging by the people in this room, this is not true for any of us. Uh, but that's her perspective on that social network. And here's another one where uh, this guy is holding a funeral for his dead fish where his Lego men are presiding. Um, this is on Facebook. And uh, if you can't see the stuff on the bottom, someone says, George, why would you do this? And someone else says, may Cod rest his soul. Um, this is not something I would ever see on Facebook connected to the people I'm connected to, but, uh, but it's brilliant. And we saw it actually twice. Uh, once when it just came through Facebook being shared popularly, and the second time when it came through lamebook.com. So we can take the data and we can just start to count things. Um, and that's pretty much the simplest way to look at anything. And one of the questions we've looked at is how people use different physical devices to consume social data. Um, and we looked at it over the course of a typical week. So we have um, Monday at midnight here on the very left and Sunday on the very right. And each, uh, this is normalized for time zones, so each peak is the usage during the day. Uh, the blue is a computer of this variety. It's called desktop in the image because we're not sure what to call it. But it's a computer browser. Uh, red is a smartphone, either an iPhone or an Android device. Uh, the black line is the iPad and some Android tablets. And then the green line is the gaming devices. And there's something really interesting in Thursday, if you follow that green line. Um, and I think we can blame that on college students. 
but we see a huge spike in usage of gaming devices to look at social media Thursday night. You can also follow the course of a typical day by the, the peak of smartphone usage uh, versus computer usage, which I think is really interesting. Uh, and tablets, we actually, we had a big bet uh, in my group about what time of day tablet usage would peak. And I lost the bet because I thought it would be in the morning and I had to buy beer for everybody. But it turns out it was in the evening. So people use their iPads at night. And if we look, this is a, another perspective on the same data where the distance between two devices is their distance it, by usage in time. Um, and so white means it's the same and dark means it's very different. Which you can still kind of see. And some of the interesting stuff here is that the Kindle is unlike any other device. Uh, and also that people use their Kindles to read social media, which we didn't really know. Uh, that the iPhone and Android is different than the Blackberry significantly. And, and if we made a graph of Blackberry usage over time, it's actually, you know, doing that. Uh, so if anyone has a Blackberry, you might want to switch to something else. Um, <laughs> Windows and Linux are similar, but Mac OS is different, which I think tells us that nerds are humans as well. But that's just from counting, right? So if we're a little clever about counting, we can learn some even more interesting things. Uh, so we wanted to be able to know for a given URL what human language that URL was in. Right? And this sounds pretty easy. So you can go, uh, we were one of those people sorely abusing Google's Translate API. Um, and you can send them the URL and they pull the content and they'll tell you what language they think it is. Um, but it turns out it doesn't actually work very well for us because we have a lot of content like this. So what language is this? So <laughs> if you ask Google's Translate API, it's English, uh, because Twitter.com is English. Uh, there are English words in it. But we consider this to be Japanese, because only someone who speaks Japanese would want to see this piece of content. <laughs> and really, <laughs> I don't know what it means. Um, so we found another way to apply language labels that I think is pretty neat. Uh, we realized that we were grabbing the, um, the HTTP request headers for the languages of the computers looking at a given link. And those headers look like this. So they're just these sort of raw strings that say, you know, uh, give me US English. If you can't give me that, give me any English. Give me Spanish. Uh, generally, people will go to whatever their native language is, perhaps some other variation of it, and then English. Um, but we took these headers, and we realized that if we built looked at the distribution of languages on a given URL. So this is a link in Spanish about Google+. Um, and then we can see the different languages here. So the most people in Spanish, second is English, third is Catalan, fourth I think is Russian, uh, and then French, Portuguese, and so on. Um, those are the languages that are set in the settings of the people looking at that URL. And so we can use this to apply the appropriate language label to our URLs. And that's all the code it takes, and it's even well commented. <laughs> it's nice little Python in NumPy. So it's really simple, extremely simple, and yet it works uh, very well. So now we have a system that tells us that for a link like this, if at least a few people have clicked on it, we can give you a pretty good language label, and if a lot of people have clicked on it, we have a high confidence on that label. And so that's sort of a fun, um, like a fun look at things you can figure out when you're counting a little bit cleverly. Uh, and this, by the way, is available on an API. We cheated. Um, we used Google's Translate API to label a bunch of content and then validated unambiguous content and then validated against that. It, that would be a good idea for the future. So to be slightly more serious, um, it turns out the internet actually has a major role to play in human communication. Uh, and we decided to look at uh, traffic through Bitly during the Arab Spring. And so if you do, uh, you can see at the top is Syria, then Bahrain, then Egypt, then, yes, it's Yemen, Tunisia, and Libya. Um, and this is going uh, 
I can't quite read the labels, but it's through the whole period of the Arab Spring ending last summer uh, in 2011. And so we can zoom in. And this is just raw uh, clicks from these countries during that time period. It's not modified at all. Uh, this is Egypt. So if you remember, they actually shut the internet off. So this is the internet traffic graph for that period immediately leading up to the cutoff. Um, and that's our graph, which mirrors it you know, fairly closely, just this little piece. And this one is far more interesting. So this is Tunisia. Uh, where there was no le network level interference with um, people's access to technology. And something really cool happens here. So that's where the revolution happened. So we can see that that change in society caused a change in behavior through social networks that we see reflected here. And this is an entirely natural drop off immediately after the revolution. And the traffic has been slowly increasing over time in a linear way since then. Um, but this huge burst in the lead up was entirely natural and it was mostly Facebook traffic. Please. <laughs> well, this is the next slide, right? Um, <laughs> uh, that, you mean when the tech bubble will burst? Or, uh, when? Right. Yes. That is a very good question. Uh, so we did um, sort of play with some prediction models, and we ended up predicting a revolution in Morocco that never happened. So I won't, I, I'm definitely not qualified to speak about um, the answer to the question, but it is a good question. Um, and we did, we have shared this data with political scientists who do have the domain expertise to actually draw meaningful conclusions. But if anyone wants to look at it, uh, it's available. One of the things we've been hindered by is the fact that uh, we mostly speak English uh, at Bitly, and it's very hard to look at, you know, like a Facebook video uh, in Arabic and figure out if it has any impact whatsoever on events that might have occurred at that time. So to lighten the mood a bit, uh, one of the things we can do is, can, is visualize our data as a graph. And we can take, uh, the nodes can either be people and the connections can be how many links they have in common, or we can do it the other way around where the nodes are the links and the connections are how many people have co-clicked those things. And we find that um, we can do some, some uh, you know, look at fairly normal things on the internet. So this is a Playtex advertising promotion. Um, and this unfortunate woman in the video doesn't know how to wear a bra and her friends are telling her how to wear the bra. Um, you know, I don't make this stuff up, like, <laughs> but it turns out that people who click on this link also click on this link, which is an Etsy product. Um, they click on this, which you can't really see it, um, but this poor tiger's cubs died, and so the zookeepers wrapped piglets in tiger fur for her to take care of so she would not be depressed anymore. This is a Facebook story. It's really sweet. And they click on this, which is our Japanese sandals designed to leave different kinds of footprints when you're on the beach. <laughs> and we find in general that the set of things that people click on is very different than the set of things they share. Um, and so I think, especially for those in the room who look at Twitter data, uh, you're seeing the set of things that people publicly share and tie into their identity. And I can tell you that it tends to be much more intellectually stimulating than the sets of things they actually read. Um, at Bitly, we call this the kitten chicken problem, where that's what people share and that's what people read. Um, it's, it's been a very useful metaphor for us. Uh, and we find that there's only one kind of content that people both share and read, and that's things like this, which is Blue Ivy Carter's Tumblr. That's uh, Jay-Z and Beyonce's baby. So it meets the salacious criteria of being gossip, so people read it, but it's also about a cute baby, so they share it. Um, and in fact, we modeled attention to that when it came out, and there was a huge spike of up to 22 clicks per second uh, the moment that link became public. And I'll come back to this. We're also really interested in, uh, in not just the immediate link-to-link -link graph, but understanding the context around a link or an idea. 
And so this is something we did with Scientific American last December, where we were curious about how people read science on the internet and what else they read. So we went and found a bunch of scientific content. Um, and this, we used our own classifiers to tag it as science, but also lists of domains that we need to be scientific content. Uh, we, we classified them by the scientific subdomains, so things like biology, chemistry, computer science, engineering, physics, uh, et cetera. And then we went one step out in the graph and grabbed everything else those people had read and uh, built this little network. Uh, and so there are a few funny things here, right? So like sports and statistics are close together along with weather, that makes sense. I think health and food are very close together. Um, math is nowhere near statistics, but they're both sort of near computer science, which makes sense, I suppose. Um, the thing that they ended up leading with uh, physics and fashion being close together is the headline for the piece, but it turns out the week we did this, there was an article about clothing made out of milk that was very popular in the physicist community, uh, which led to that. Um, but there are a couple of weird things, like travel you know, is pretty evenly distributed and off on the side, that's fine. Um, but the two up there are religion and chemistry, and there was actually one other category that we didn't include in the public visualization, which was adult content. Um, it turns out that people who read about religion, chemistry, and pornography only read about those things. They are not well connected <laughs> into the rest of the graph. <laughs> those three things. Oh, no, I mean they are each their own cluster. <laughs> not to slander chemists. <laughs> Just to say that perhaps they need more friends. Um, So another thing we did recently is to look at how people in the United States read U US news. Um, and this is something we did with John Bruner at Forbes. Um, and they were pretty excited about sort of understanding the influence of different publications in different places. Uh, and so we came up with this map. And actually, if you Google it, it's interactive. And it's way better on the website than it could possibly be in a static way. So you can actually you know, play with it and see which stories uh, were most interesting. I brought it up here because this was actually a challenge for us because the very first thing we did was you know, ask the question, okay, what are the top news sources in the United States? So that meant that we generated a list of all the top domains and you know, went down the list by hand until we found enough news sources. And then we normalized it by DNS level data that we have and then by Google News rankings. But that was a choice we had to make. And then we had to ask the question, so the first graph we made uh, only had two colors. It was Huffington Post and New York Times, because Huffington Post and New York Times are the two best publications in the United States at social media promotion. So we had to ask the question of how do you possibly normalize the data such that you can actually find a good story in it? Uh, and we, we again, meaning um, one of my colleagues, <laughs> went through about six different methods before we decided uh, on this one. Um, so what you're actually seeing here is the distance from the mean for that publication by state. Um, and so while we say The Onion is disproportionately influential in Wisconsin, that means that of all the publications we looked at, uh, that one was uh, the furthest from the mean in positive readership there. Uh, and that, that worked out pretty well. It actually taught us a couple of interesting things. Like, did you know that USA Today actually has people who read it online? Um, half of their paid subscribers are hotel rooms that don't know they're paying for it. Um, so that was kind of amazing. Uh, NPR is disproportionately represented in Oregon. Oh, yes, uh, the colors are a little hard to distinguish here. So Al Jazeera actually didn't show up uh, anywhere, but it does, I think I found it here. So this is the New York Times relative preference graph. Uh, so you see, of course, New York is heavily biased, but um, the rest of the country, it has influence in some places and not in others. Uh, this is Al Jazeera. Uh, so while it was not the top publication anywhere, um, that's where people look at it. And these are the stories they were looking at during the month of data we looked on. Yes. Yes. 
Absolutely. Um, so we looked, yeah, this is just one month of data, and we're hoping to update it um, at least every qu quarter or so to. Oh, really? <laughs> you know, I'm learning so many interesting things from just doing this project. Like, the, one of the people who runs the Associated Press got really mad. Um, because they actually pay us, their clients, and uh, they weren't on this list. Um, but it turns out that they don't host the content on their own site, so they always send you to partner sites, and so we were not actually tracking it here. Um, but speaking of the election cycle, uh, we can think about this guy, um, and we can actually go through and apply the top headline by state at any given moment about Romney, and um, it's much too dim. But I, I can show you this live a little later. Uh, but this is a way to get a very quick sense of uh, how people in different geographies feel about a topic. Uh, and we can do this based on those location labels that, again, are, uh, we apply them off the distributions of locations of people actually reading the piece of content. So we're really interested in this idea of how ideas spread from person to person. And the word idea is deliberately vague um, and not computational. What we've built so far is only a beginning in understanding that. Um, but this is changing the way that we think about a lot of different problems. It's changing the way we think about journalism. And so there is a big movement right now towards digital journalism, which is getting people who think in this way, in the way that you guys think and getting them to try and find the right stories at the right time and present them in such a way that they take very complex issues and make them easy for people to understand. Uh, and so we're doing, we're looking at how new ideas emerge in the data and then spread geographically and spread through social networks. And one in particular uh, that we've been working on this week is the story of Trayvon Martin, who is tragically killed on February 26th. Uh, and I'm sure you've all heard about this. Um, but what you probably didn't know, at least I didn't know it until I looked at this graph, was that for the first week, nobody cared. So it was a little local Florida story. And then all of a sudden, his parents gave an interview and somebody made a Wikipedia entry, and it just took off. So someone, there's a Justice Department investigation, Obama comments on it, and then the media interest has been sustained. Um, this is from April 3rd. We have to extend the graphic. Um, but this little blurb caused that whole thing and the way this spread. Uh, and if you look at the bit.ly attention to it, you can see that here. Uh, we also mapped it out. So this is immediately after the Wikipedia page came out. Um, so it starts in Florida. It goes national. It goes to the coasts and then eventually to the entire country. Uh, and then from the entire country to the world. And just in case you wanted to see that again. Cool. So changing gears again, that's one idea spreading through one set of content. Um, another sort of thing we look at is how content spreads on networks uh, in terms of trying to understand the dynamics of the different networks. Uh, and so one project we did was to try to figure out what the half-life of a link is on the different social networks. Uh, that is, how long after you share a link will it get half of the clicks it will ever get? Uh, and it turns out there are two things that affect that. One is the network itself and you know, characteristics of how it's designed. And the second is the kind of content. So this is the first kind of content we looked at. Um, what somebody told me is called in the marketing world evergreen content or things you find awesome whenever you happen to see them. <laughs> and clicks to this look like this. So um, this is per 10 minutes. Uh, we see this spike and this decay. And then the second kind of content we looked at is breaking news content. Um, and in particular, at the time we did this project, we looked at a bunch of articles about the East Coast earthquake. I d could you feel it here in Vermont? Barely. Barely. Um, <laughs> right. Was Twitter faster than the earthquake? Um, and 
the pattern of attention to that looks like this. So a very quick spike in decay. And that's typical of breaking news stories. Um, or very good gossip. And someone at a major news source told me uh, yesterday that they see that kind of pattern I've only for huge financial market shifting events and for sporting events. So in the end, it turns out that uh, if you look at the average link, the half-life on Twitter is 2.8 hours, the half-life on Facebook is 3.1 hours, uh, and then it only gets longer from there with some weird anomalies like YouTube, which is about seven hours and shows a kind of different uh, pattern, and also stumble upon, which isn't here, but essentially uh, they will keep increasing the amount of traffic they send you until you run out of money, and then it plummets. So one of the issues we ran into is figuring out uh, which links were being actually shared by real human beings and clicked on by real human beings. And I keep alluding to this because it's a challenge. Um, and which links are being clicked on by bots, by scrapers, by people like you trying to get some of the data, um, or by people who are just doing very different things with their content. Um, in fact, we have lots of bizarre use cases where people use Bitly uh, sometimes to wrap around JavaScript files they embed in a site they don't control or around uh, an image that they might use as an avatar somewhere so they can see how many people viewed their profile. Um, lots of, we even had someone send in a resume with Bitly links for every project so he would know when we actually clicked on them. Um, lots of very clever uses that are not this uh, one human sharing a piece of content with another. And so we decided to study what qualifies as organic content. Um, and we always see this pattern. So it's the spike and decay pattern. Again, my favorite organic link ever. Um, and a fairly simple distribution. So you can see this one is almost all Facebook and uh, English-speaking countries because it's an English language page. But if we're looking at links that are not that popular, just here are three random ones, uh, you still see this sort of pattern. Uh, and this is for, this is an FML site in Spanish, so you tell stories about why your life is miserable and people bond over it. Um, this is a music album, and anyone with kids will know this one. Um, but if we look at things that don't match that pattern, we find uh, things like this, which is, again, one of those little forum avatars. Uh, this, which must be spam, uh, probably email spam. And the last one was actually malware, so um, I won't show it to you. We had already blocked it at the time I looked at the data. So this was a project where we started with very elaborate uh, mathematical models of what constituted an organic link. And we started by looking at historical data, which meant we had the luxury of sort of taking the complete time series uh, and looking at all kinds of features about that complete time series. Uh, and after we did that, we realized, well, we can't actually run this uh, at scale because we don't have enough computers, and also the, uh, we can't wait that long. So we need to know, uh, as the click comes in, based on all the information we've seen to date, uh, whether it is organic or not. And this really, uh, this is a very canonical problem in a, a new kind of calculation metaphor. So traditionally, um, you have your data, you iterate through it as many times as you like, and your algorithm comes to some result. Uh, in this kind of system, you have a stream of data where you only have the luxury of seeing each item in that stream one time, and you still have to make some decision about it. And that item, that decision can be influenced by the past, but it can't be influenced by the future, which sounds like an odd thing when you say it out loud, but, um, but makes sense in this context. So we ended up using a random forest of decision trees. Um, there are a couple of reasons to do this. The primary one is that it's fast. The secondary one is that it's highly interpretable. So we can go back and introspect and see why any particular click was organic or not organic. Uh, and instead of using the time series features, we ended up using the combination of countries and referrers sending traffic to the link and found that that's almost as accurate as the complete time series. All right. I've been talking for a long time, so I promise you I'm getting to the demo shortly. Um, I've shown you a lot of things that involve you know, counting, counting cleverly, building a few simple algorithms, playing with a lot of data. Uh, but I think the real opportunity for this kind of data is in helping people who make decisions uh, 
where real-time information would be useful to make better decisions. Uh, and I say that kind of vaguely because that might be uh, if you're trying to decide where to eat, you might want to know if your favorite restaurant is on fire. Uh, or if you're a hedge fund trader, you might want to know if some event has happened in the market. Uh, or if you're just someone who's sort of curious about the world, uh, without spending too much time reading the news, you might want to get a sense of what has happened since you last paid attention. Uh, and so we're investigating the space of real-time search. Uh, I put search in parentheses because search is an overloaded word. When you think of search, you think of Google, and you think of putting in a query and getting back a list of facts about that query. Uh, we think about search the other way. So you define a subsection of the data that you are curious about, and then within that, we tell you what is interesting at the moment. Uh, and we have two sets of infrastructure we've built around this problem. The first one is a traditional search engine in the sense that documents are indexed. It is not a traditional search engine in uh, the way the rankings can vary by second. So half of the values for any given link are calculated at index time, and those are things like TFIDF and some of those category labels and all that fun stuff that does not change. The other half are calculated uh, at query time. So we have a cluster of servers running Redis, if anyone's curious. Uh, that's an in-memory database where we can very quickly go out and grab uh, all of that data to make uh, a real-time ranking decision. So the other side of that problem, that's search. That's assuming you have a query. We can get you the real-time data that fits it. The other side of it is, okay, I don't have a query. I have a data stream. Tell me what's interesting. So you can say, give me all of the clicks coming from New York City and show me the phrases that are interesting in New York City. Uh, or you can say it for sports, or you can say it for things happening on Facebook in New York City that involve cats. Um, and we do this by pulling each link, extracting those key phrases, and then building a continuous time series of clicks on that phrase. And then we look at the actual rate of clicks versus our expected rate of clicks. And we define anything that defies that to be a burst. Uh, we don't use the word trend because that is another very overloaded word, um, but it is somewhat analogous to Twitter's trending topics, just based on what people pay attention to, not based on what they're saying. Uh, so the actual data is very different than what you see there. Um, and to go, I don't have to go into this in depth. Um, I'm certainly, I'm running a little short on time. Uh, but essentially, it's a moving average of clicks per second on that phrase. Uh, we've actually built a database that does this uh, as the piece of data is inserted into the database, it updates the calculation. So it's a pretty cool piece of infrastructure. And we've reduced it down to a sum, uh, which means that it's possible to do at scale very quickly. Uh, it's a continuous function that makes sense in human terms. So when I tell you clicks per second is x, x actually makes sense uh, in a way that you understand as a person. Uh, it's linear and it's really fast. Um, and then, because we are not academics, we can totally cheat, and we chose a distribution where we bias it such that for something to go from zero to bursting, uh, it requires a lot more clicks than if it um, is going from a small number to a large number, and that keeps things from spammy things from showing up in the data. All right, so I've been talking a lot. I'm gonna try and actually show this to you. Oh, you can see that, great. So this is something that we've been working on only for about two weeks, but it's built on this infrastructure that we've been building on, working on for a long time. And it is a mashup of that thing that sits on the data stream figuring out what people are clicking on and paying attention to you and our search. Uh, so the top link at the link level right now is this Adobe Photoshop CS6 beta. Uh, the second one is this Economist article. Uh, as they flash, that is actually somebody clicking on that link. And our current latency in the entire system is six seconds. So that's from the time someone clicks that link to the time it shows up in this UI, uh, including the WebSockets piece, which is pretty badass. Um, we're trying to get that down to only a couple of seconds. Uh, these phrases up here are from the entire data stream, uh, what people are currently paying attention to. So we can maybe go see what's up with Brad Pitt. 
they're engaged. <laughs> um, no, all that's boring. Let's see what's going on with teen idols. Uh, unfortunately, the things that tend to get the most attention are often the gossip. But this also lets us do things, like when I loaded it up, this is an empty query. So it's just saying, give me the URLs that are most popular right now. Oh, and it changed. Um, they will actually fly up and down if they change, but the, the rate that that happens at is kind of slow. But like I said earlier, we can go in and say, give me the set of URLs being clicked disproportionately in Burlington, Vermont, and order them for me by popularity. Uh, that looks like a deal. That's a Kickstarter project. Beer. I don't know what that is. ESPN. All right. Can do this for New York. And <laughs> you can see it's <laughs> <laughs> things that New Yorkers care about. Um, I should have mentioned before the demo that none of this is censored in any way, so um, <laughs> hopefully nobody is easily offended. Um, but it also lets us do some fun things like say, okay, let, show me all the links getting disproportionate traffic in New York from Tumblr. Um, and so we can see what's going on in the world of Tumblr. Um, or we can say, okay, that's fine, show me Twitter instead. Okay, <laughs> not so different today. Uh, or we can say, show me all the Etsy.com products getting traffic from Twitter. These are always usually hilarious. <laughs> all right. So that's, this is the debug interface into those phrases that are bursting. And hopefully this is still up. So for each of them, I loaded this up before the talk, so I should have had a little more traffic since then. So this is all click the rate of clicks per second on the phrase Boston Marathon. Um, and it was bursting just earlier, so I loaded it up so I'd have something fun to show you. Uh, and we can go see all the links that are contributing to that phrase. And if we do this, you can see which one is which. Uh, and we can actually, we have the page that tells us what's bursting, but we can do this for, um, for any phrase that we're tracking. So, just Vermont. I'm trying to think of neutral. <laughs> So uh, this is the bit.ly info page, Vermont governor chased by bears. Very popular right now. <laughs> you know, Cory Booker is saving people from burning buildings. Your governor is uh, getting chased by bears. All right. Um, so that seems like a good point to, uh, to return to the slides. Uh, and just wrap up the talk. Um, so I hope that uh, this has actually been interesting for you. Um, and I hope that the approach we take, where we tend to ask questions and then do math and build the pieces of infrastructure we need to support those questions has come across. Uh, we do have a joke we use at Bitly where, um, you know the fortune cookie game where you add in bed or with a chainsaw to the end of whatever your fortune cookie says? We always do it at scale. So whenever someone says, wouldn't it be cool if, we try adding at scale to the end of that sentence and see if we're still scared. Um, and another thing that's really important is that we always have to know uh, when we've won. Um, and that means we have to be able to measure the success of whatever we're working on. Uh, and so the very 
Well, the second question we ask after, you know, what is the idea and why is it a good idea, is how will we know when we've won? Uh, and then how do we communicate it effectively? Uh, which might mean, you know, do we write a paper about it? Do we make a blog post about it? Do we go give a talk about it? Or do we just build a product and hope that people love it? Um, and then the last thing I'd like to leave you with is that you should always try to think about the really crazy questions. Um, because those are the ones that tend to lead to the most interesting projects. Uh, the questions that you're kind of embarrassed to say out loud. Like, find someone you trust and say them out loud. Um, and I'll give an example. Uh, I've been fairly obsessed with figuring out how big the internet is. Um, and I'm mainly obsessed with it because I know people who know the answer. They work for Google and they won't tell me. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that <laughs> it's just really not nice. Um, and so we've recently been able to come up with a reasonable estimate of this because we work with VeriSign and so we have all the .com DNS data. And so um, actually, does anyone want to guess how many active .com domains there are in a given day? So I was wildly wrong in my initial guess. 17 million, anyone? Yes, active, accessed at least one time. According to the DNS. Okay, this is actually domains. So I had guessed a billion. The actual answer is around 100 million. Um, and I can tell you that .com domains make up about 80% of the domains that Bitly sees. So I'll allow you to complete the calculation. And it's not the size of the internet, but it is the size of the active internet, which I think is the most important part. Um, and the last question, uh, if you spend any time on the West Coast, you'll be asked this all the time. On the East Coast, it's how do you make money. On the West Coast, it's how do you change the world. Um, <laughs> it is important to think about the impact your work can have. Um, the biggest problem we have is prioritizing the different things we can work on. And so thinking about potential impact and building things that lead to the world we want to be in. Like we honestly could have just sold the data out and made lots of money and gone home, but we didn't want to do that because that's not the world we want to be in. Uh, so thank you. Um. I think we have time for questions. Yeah. All right, I'll bring it around. Okay. Okay. Good. Hi, thanks very much. My question is, how does Bitly make money? <laughs> what do you do for your projects that are paid for you, and how much of it has to come from grants, if any? Um, so we, we don't have any grant money. We are venture-backed. Um, which means that we have investors who have given us uh, a number of millions of dollars that we are trying to use to build a huge company. Uh, we have a product called Bitly Enterprise, which is a software as a service dashboard for publishers, brands, and celebrities. That is people who care about uh, how their content is perceived online, where they pay us money and we give them back a lot of data about that. Um, and they also get their branded short links um, and a lot of happiness. Uh, we do have, um, and since we have a little bit of time, I can show you, we have a new version of our consumer app coming out shortly. These are actually my bookmarks. That's a GitHub project. It's nothing bad. Um, but this is a reimagination of how you keep links on the internet. So anything you'd want to keep and search, it's incredibly fast um, and easy to use, but it also has all of the statistics. Well, I didn't actually share that link. Um, I didn't share that one either. So you can see uh, that I shared this on Twitter, and it drove 341 clicks out of 4,000, and 79 people saved it, including my friend Ilya, who works at Google and won't tell me how big the internet is. Um, the other side of this is that we've added this network view which shows you all the things that the people you're connected to on other social networks are sharing. Um, and so we have some sports thing, some music thing. 
Um, yeah, that guy is on my team. She works at the New York Times. Um, yeah, a lot of interesting stuff. That's the Museum of Natural History. I don't know what the story is. Um, but we're hoping that this product then enhances the enterprise product as well. And this will be out in the next few months. And if anyone wants to be a beta tester, let me know. Hello. Okay. So first of all, thank you very much. Very interesting talk. Uh, one question I have is about the privacy. So you said this: all this data is public, so I can go in there and see what is everybody else sharing. On the other hand, if I go to my Facebook and share something with just my friends, then you can take that and show the world. Is that is that right? Oh, or? No, no, no. So okay. yes, that's a very good question, and we actually think about privacy a lot. Um, and in fact, one of my recent responsibilities was writing our privacy policy which is the kind of thing that in Rhode Island we call a wicked hard problem because you start out thinking it's trivial and then you know eight hours later you're ready to tear your hair out and you've gotten nowhere. Um, we think about privacy very carefully and the way I ended up breaking it down was to essentially develop a list of the atomic actions you can generate, you can do that generate data and whether those are inherently public or private actions. So if you share a link publicly to Twitter through Bitly we are happy sharing that data. If you click on a link, that's a private action, and we will never share that you clicked on that link. We will share that you know, 300 people clicked on the link, um, and that the link contains these phrases and all that stuff. Um, but it, it's, and it's not even that simple, because if I shorten a link, and then I email it to you, and you're the only person who's seen it, and you click on it, and then I say publicly that one person has clicked on it, have I then violated your privacy or my privacy? So it is a little bit tricky to define these things and think about the edge cases, uh, but we are trying to do it the right way. In uh, healthcare data uh, security, we um, often won't publish a cell with less than five or 10 people in it. For, for that reason, it's a mm -hmm. rough rule of thumb. Although with the scale of data you have, uh, I think you could probably figure out the five people in most cells. <laughs> Thanks for your great talk. Uh, one of the most interesting things from my perspective was this half-life of a link of really interesting time series data. It's very rich and very temporally refined, right? So my question is in this you know, political season that's coming up, there's some concern that rumors that are false could spread through and destroy a campaign over the course of 24 hours before an election um, without, t given, given the state of social networks right now, without time to sort of verify the, what, what's being talked about. And my question is, um, have you thought about looking at some of these time series data to uh, maybe identify the signature in terms of clicks of which stories end up not being true? I think that would be a great project. Um, we've thought about it philosophically, like can, is it true? How quickly does misinformation travel versus truthful information? I and mean, is it the same? Or I've heard people claim that uh, lies tend to die out quicker but I haven't yet seen any evidence to that effect. Um, and so, you know, without going and starting an army of Twitter bots to spread malicious rumors about people, um, yeah, we'll have to look at the past. But if you have a good source of labeled misinformation, that would be a really interesting project. Hello. Hi. So a, a specific and somewhat comical case that I've actually been wondering about for a while is with The Onion. Because every now and again, you see, well, this is usually a picture linked to Reddit or something else, where they take a snapshot of a bunch of people who have commented um, rather angrily on articles from The Onion, all the while not knowing that it's a parody site. <laughs> <laughs> so is there any way of distinguishing when people are linking The Onion, actually thinking it's real? versus <laughs> thinking, here the, here the funny parody. So I think The Onion has done a brilliant job of sort of distilling an algorithm for humor. And part of their success metric must be 
uh, like if everyone knows it's humor, it's not that funny, right? So like they must have some optimal number of people who don't get it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and perhaps we can, you know, infer what their algorithm is, um, but we, we should look at that. We did, when we did the U.S. Uh, news piece with Forbes, we left The Onion in the top set of news sources. That was my decision. I thought it would be funny. Um, but there were several comments on the Forbes site and on uh, a few people who blogged about the piece uh, where people thought that Forbes did not know it was a satire. Um, and got really angry that it was included. Uh, hi, so um, first I'm really amazed by the amount of data that you guys are collecting from what seems like such a simple service on its face. And uh, I'm curious, you know, you've, you've looked, we've looked at a lot of different stuff and it can go in so many different directions. And I'm wondering when you guys decided to start really analyzing all this data that you or when you started to decide to start collecting and analyzing it, I mean, do you have like a high-level mission statement, or are you just saying let's let's do some science? Uh, I'm curious, like, what was the driving? <laughs> so, factor? at the moment, our high-level mission statement is to understand the internet in real time. Uh, but that still leaves a lot of decisions to be made about where you spend your time. Um, the Billy is an interesting case because, again, it, it was nobody woke up one day at, like, and was a brilliant entrepreneur who said, I'm going to make a URL shortener, and I'm going to corner the URL shortening market, and like, world domination will follow. Um, like Our founding story is not at all like that. It was really a feature of another product that accidentally became really big. Um, and then uh, the idea was always that there was value in the data, so we kept it. Um, but initially, like I was the sixth person to formally join Bitly, uh, and I showed up, and they said, all right, here are the database keys, don't break anything, have fun. Um, nobody had looked at any of the data at all, um, and it, it was not even in a format where it could be looked at at that time. Uh, and so there, there was always this notion that we should find value and build a billion dollar business. Um, we've made some progress on the former, and perhaps not enough progress on the latter yet. Um, but I do spend a lot of time thinking about uh, what we're doing now, and what this, what piece we're building now that will enable us to do something interesting next. Um, and a lot of the things we've built made logical sense in sequence. So we built a system that can fetch all the URLs and store them. We built a system that can extract the content from the URLs and store that. We built a search engine. We built a system that can use that search engine uh, to track things over time. Um, and so I have a general sense of where we're going, and I know what my crazy questions are that I'd like to answer in the next year, and then I sort of pick the pieces that best optimize our limited resources along the way, and also the ones that give us opportunities to actually build a business. So uh, we have a product called Reputation Monitoring that runs on that search service, where if you're a brand, you can watch the volume and sentiment of traffic around your brand, uh, and that made a lot of sense, so we built that. Um, and we have a few other ideas along those lines uh, coming up shortly. Well, before we break up, if anyone has a question they didn't get to ask or is too shy, my email is h at bit.ly or hmason on Twitter, and I'm happy to talk offline. So there's this uh, local site around here called Front Porch Forum that does like email uh, newsletters that are in your neighborhood, and I know from a friend that used to work there that they use Bitly links so that they can have sort of a basic tracking of what the links get clicked on, and, and it's kind of like a poor person's version of analytics. I'm just wondering if you're thinking about like uh, offering kind of a tiered levels of, uh, of this enterprise product for a company that's smaller and wouldn't be able to pay a thousand dollars a month, but you still might be able to provide um, you know, analytics for them. So we do a lot of that for free, actually. Um, you can set up your own short domain through Bitly, and you can write, uh, like you can use the APIs to get all that data out, and you do get a dashboard. Um, it's just not quite as fancy as the one that people pay for. Um, and our, I'm not an expert in product development, but our attitude around that has been, there are a few number of people who are willing to pay a lot, 
and a lot of people who are willing to pay almost nothing. So we're going to make as much as we can free without cannibalizing the people who are willing to pay a lot and then hopefully get them to pay a lot, uh, <laughs> which seems to make sense. Thank <laughs> you.